I'm Richard Craith and I'm not enjoying this young bit. <laughs> oh, well, that was the clinch in 65, I suppose, and the 350 race. And Billy was just back for the TT and he had got on well in the TT and it was hard to beat at any time, but we were all feared home when he came back for the TT. He was like a new rider then, far quicker. But anyway, he ran away and left us and as the race went on, I was begun to get a wee bit better and a wee bit better to, to finish up. I got up on him and got squeezed by somewhere. But usually with Billy, I, I like to follow him a while and look for a wake place and pass him real fast and get away from him. But it didn't work that day. He stayed with me. <laughs> and I knew he was going to beat me in the last lap. I knew that he would beat me. I, I knew what he... I kept him behind me to the last bend and I, th I thought he'd do it now, but I know the only way he could do it was ride around me and that wouldn't have been that easy. Either that or got down the side. So I could hear the bike on my right hand side and I closed right on to the grass and I had to put on the brakes and I just managed to beat him. <laughs> that was uh, on the Clinchy in 65. Um, Two years I had rode Joe's bikes and that was the only time that, that 500 stopped for me. And before the race, Joe said to me that they would need it to change the big end on it. But he says it'll probably do this race, but he says if it starts to vibrate will you just stop. So I went well and was getting on well. And, but I lead on a couple of laps for the end, start to vibrate. I had to stop, but when Joe was telling me about the, to stop if it started to vibrate too much, I said to him, Joe, how much is too much? And he says, Sonny, when you see three sets of handlebars on every side of her, you stop her. <laughs> <laughs> the first race run was at Tandergee in 1961 on a 500 BSA. Um, I was surprised to win it. And I couldn't believe it when I did want it, but I never forgot it. It was a good feeling to win you on anyway. Every race I went to, I always tried my hardest, and done my best, and tried always to better myself if I could. Ray Flake was a South African, and him and another boy, Tom Gill, done all the continental races and had a big van, and the race scared some money, and they were getting second-hand parts and tires and things and scraping a leaving whatever way they could. And if they, at that northwest lane was starting a bit, I come on after the practice and Raymond Flake is sitting in the grass and I said to him, "What way do you get on?" And he says, "I, I had to stop." And I says, "What was wrong?" He says, "The bike was vibrating that much along them big straights. He says it was slackening all the pins in my legs." <laughs> I suppose my best race or my most memorable race should have been the one in the Grand Prix. And I never was superstitious, but I mind that morning again. I was up early and I was it, and uh, I always say, I have a bit of luck and doing the rivers below the house, and I looked in the river to see. I do that all the time, and that's a special morning. I was up early, and when I went to run the corner, there was a magpie sitting on the top of the gate. <laughs> and, thought to myself, I'm no superstitious, but I certainly looked at me a minute and I thought that's a good start to the day. <laughs> I mind sitting in the starting line and Pally was, my brother was always with me and uh, he, uh, he said to me before the start, uh, go nice and steady and, and watch yourself. And, uh, I mind sitting at the start and everything was quiet and looking around me and thinking to myself, what am I doing among all these mad men anyway? But again, I made a bad start and was maybe about eighth or tenth for a while in that race. And, but again, I kept improving as the race went on. And halfway through the race, the rain started and that suited me well. I knew I knew in the road well. And, and I was, I wouldn't say I was any better rider in the wet than any other body, but I suppose a lot of the 
trap riders weren't used to rain and bad weather the way I was. And, and when it laps, I managed to get to the Lido. And, uh, and I always remember getting up behind Paddy Drivers in the lead at the time. Um, when we were coming around Leatham Stone Bridge, I was right hand behind him. And I suppose he didn't know I was there, but the crowd was all waving, and the driver thought it was him. They were waving at him. He stood up in the fat bus and or in the fat rest and waved. And then he looked around and seen me behind him. And I'm telling you, he got started then. <laughs> it was harder after that, but I managed to, to get by him at the finish shop and won it. And, I couldn't believe myself, I won it and still can't believe it. But I never would have won anything if it hadn't been for Joe Ryan. I had two Euler brothers and they were all anti motorbikes and I was used to motorbikes for I was no age at all and I was riding bikes through the fields and air dakes and up planks and all sorts of things and like, like Len Ireland I was racing the roads and I had a wheen of mates that was the same and we were always getting into scrapes with police and neighbours and young thing and other. So I decided I would try the race and I thought, after watching the winner races, I thought I could go as quick as a lot of them boys, but I got my eyes open when I tried it. It wasn't as good as I thought. I, that was presented to me by the Kyle Ren Motor Club in 66. After I retired for racing, they had a, a special dinner and presented me with us tree and I was well pleased with that but I wasn't expecting anything like that. It was very nice of them and good of them. Oh I retired in sixty five. About seven years racing at that stage in sixty five. I'd I'd been doing all the Irish races and I had plenty of work to do at home and I'd got married and I was losing a lot of time away from work. And I wasn't going to make much more out in racing on Irish races. I would need it to, if I was going to improve, I would need it to try and went to better races maybe. And I just decided to stop. No, no regrets, no. When I, when I made up my mind, I, I didn't make it up right. That was that, and I would just stick to it. There were an incident in the scrutiny here, and that was, yeah, Joe, he always made his bikes look as bad as possible. The bike was perfect. There weren't a better bike on the Northwest or any race for that matter, no matter the bikes that I had. And the bike would have leaked a bit of oil and, and they would have sprinkled cement around it, you know, to soak up the oil. It, it, looked, it looked very bad, but it was effective. It done the job well. And anything Joe done was done right and perfect. But when I think the bikes on the scrutineers and under the 500, and they, well, the scrutineers, they knew the bikes was all right, they would have been happy enough, but uh, there some of the officials and they were watching everything and they were, a whole queue was waiting to get the bikes scrutineered and when I come for it, they, they tell me to take that bike away out of here and wash it. Then they bring it back here till it's clean. And when I turned back to Joe, he was annoyed. He said, right, we'll just put it in the van and we'll go home. That will finish that. So he done do that and he would have been him. But they apologised at the finish shop and they let us go. 